Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Conscious Marketer Podcast. This is Richard here, and I'm joined by Kylie. Hi, Kylie. Hi there. And our special guest today is Ariella Forstein. Ariella is a vocal and empowerment coach and alchemist. Um, she's delivered a TED Talk called Singing is Your Birthright. I love that. She's worked with hundreds of clients individually and in groups. Um, she's guided them to harness the power of their voices, expression, and inner authority. She values deep connection, community, mother nature, and I love this, and a splendid cup of hand-blended tea. You'd probably get along with my wife. They take their tea very seriously in Ireland. <laughs> um, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, a lot of our people um, are wanting to get more online with video and um, courses. And I, I think a big part of that is them sharing their voice. I'm kind of curious what you let, what led you down the path of, you know, teaching people how to express themselves and to become a voice coach. I've always been a singer, even when I was shy, very, very shy. I've always been a person who needed to express myself through my voice. And I grew up and I studied music. I studied, I was in choirs. I then took voice lessons as soon as my voice was mature enough to start to shape it. And then in college, I majored in music and voice. And after college, I went to Los Angeles, did a fellowship, and then was pursuing my dreams as a singer. And in order to pursue your dreams as a singer, you need to make money. So I was like, I can teach this. So I started teaching voice. And very quickly, I learned that voice lessons are not limited to just singing. They're limited to speaking. They're limited to self, or they're, they're, they're applicable to self-expression of all forms. And that if I only worked with people who per, were pursuing singers singing, I was limiting myself. And so then I started to include people in business and people in entrepreneurship because I was in entrepreneurship and it became this whole thing about the unlimited voice and how to express your most authentic self. That's really beautiful. I'm kind of curious because I, I know I've heard my voice back and I can't listen to any of the podcasts that I record or whatever. And I'm, I'm sure it's probably a common thing that you can't listen to your own voice because it, it's almost like, I don't know, hearing yourself back, but you, you're not used to it. So it makes you feel weird. Is that true? Or is there some science behind why you can't listen to your own voice? There is a lot of science around the voice. I don't know about science behind that, but I do know that the voice and our iteration of our expression and our personality is one of the most vulnerable things. So when we, I remember when we used to have the old uh, voicemail recorders and I'd leave a voicemail and then I'd hear myself back, I'd be like, ah, that's, that's not how I think I sound. There's two components to that. It's actually not how you sound to yourself because in our inner ears, we hear our voice differently than our voice is played back to us. So we might be thinking, ah, is that even me? But the second part is that vulnerable part. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's a practice to be able to sit with our vocal expression and hear it back. I guess, I guess there's that, was it fight, flight or, um, flee or whatever it is. And I'm more like, I'll, I'll keep going out there and putting my voice out there as long as I don't have to listen to my voice back. <laughs> 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 but yeah, but maybe it is that vulnerable part of wanting to be perfect or not wanting to judge yourself and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you decided to help businesses and kind of expand your work. How, did, how did it become a real business for you? How did you grow it? You know, a lot of our people are growing their businesses based on their soul calling. How did, how did yours kind of unfold naturally for you? That thing that we all learn as business people, where you have a product or a service, you're putting it out there, you get a few good interactions, you get a few good. My first voice student was incredible. I taught her out of my bedroom. That's how it happened at 26. Um, <laughs> but and then you're like, how can I, how can I scale this? How can I make this my job? Or how can I 
become very successful at this. And then you have to do all of the things that most of us are doing, whether it's taking classes, getting a coach. I did both of those things. Uh, looking at other people in your industry and putting it all together in that imperfect way and just going for it. And that's, that's how I built it. That's how I'm still building it, even though I'm much more experienced and comfortable with it. That's awesome. When someone comes to you, when an entrepreneur comes to you and they want to work on their voice, they, I'm assuming they want to sound stronger. They want to be more influential, things of that nature. What are some of the first things that you do with them to help them? First, I like to have a conversation. I know that when people come to see me, 9.7 out of 10 times, they're very nervous. Even if it wasn't hard for them to write the email, that first session where we're going to make sound, they're nervous. And I know that, and it's natural to be nervous. So first we just talk. And in the discussion, I get so much information from what is said and from what is not said. I'm a very, like a lot of people who are listening to this, maybe I'm a very intuitive, empathic person. I feel things very deeply. And so Sometimes when somebody says, yeah, when I get up in front of people, my palms get sweaty, my knees start to shake, or my voice, I'm scared my voice is going to crack, or all of those very common things. And I'm sometimes able to read, like, like I can see how the shoulders might shrink. I can feel how there might be this insecurity around their family members, or interpersonal connection, or this or that. It's different for everybody. And then I ask questions based on what I feel. And then we get deep into the crevices of it's not, people think they just need vocal technique when they come to work with me. And again, 9.7 out of 10 times, it is the mind, body, spirit voice. It is all of it. And if you're just getting perfect voice technique and you apply it, but you're still shaking at the knees or you're still really scared of what others think of you, or you're still, you know, have this childhood trauma that has kept you from speaking your actual truth or any of the above, your technique is not going to make you sound better. <laughs> it's just going to make your voice a little stronger or something. So it's that conversation at first, and then we can do some exercises. I find over the years, I've learned how to make people feel generally safe so that they can open their voice. Because if we don't feel safe, again, those, the barriers come up and the breath gets cut off. And it's that combination. It's that finessing of our humanity, I guess. It kind of mirrors a lot of what we talk about. Cause we sometimes say that marketing is a spiritual practice. <laughs> Cause when you start to speak your voice and do a video online, it's cathartic, it's cathartic in a way of you're sharing your truth, you're standing in front of things, you have to be okay to have criticism or and a lot of that criticism is you're giving yourself. And so if you can, if you can learn to share your work online, and so they can be of service to others, it's a real transformative process. So I would say you're doing a lot of, you know, you should have double majored in voice and therapy, right? You could, <laughs> you could combine the two. And I'm sure you do as you know, intuitively you do. So, so if somebody does have a lot of stuff coming up, do you have some ways that you work with them or a unique method that you help them to kind of come to come to open up their voice so they can speak their truth and can start doing that in a safe way? Definitely. And like I said before, it's different for everybody. So it's my business for many years has been called the Ariella approach. So I guess it's a, an approach and it really is a deeper listening. My approach is a deeper listening. It's not the best approach for everybody, but is it is the best approach for some people. Sometimes the thing when there there comes a block or a thing that needs to be worked through, sometimes we need to approach it somatically. Now I feel very comfortable and confident to do this because I've been doing it for 16 years and over the years you build new approaches and new techniques and I've taken classes and trainings to understand more of this in my own body and then I naturally apply it to these sessions. Sometimes we need to stop and pause and put our hands on maybe the belly and the heart or ground our feet deep into the ground and take some deep breaths from there because oftentimes the issues that come with the voice, like, like 
any issues in life are in the mind, they start in the mind, whether it's conscious or subconscious. And to get somatically into the body is one practice and approach that can help us be more comfortable with our voice. Sometimes it's allowing the person to simply stop and cry or nervously laugh or feel the emotion that will come through, <laughs> which let me tell you that TEDx talk that you mentioned at the beginning that I did when I was practicing for that, I had a number of crying sessions because I was so nervous for it. It, it brought up all of my own nerves and anxiety because it was this next level thing that was a dream come true, but that didn't, didn't mean it wasn't so scary for me. So in this work, sometimes these harder emotions will come up and the approach sometimes is to actually express them in hopefully a safe place. What are some of the common blocks that you see on that pathway for your clients to find that authentic voice? It's fun because if I, again, if I were just teaching the technical, which is a small part of what I teach, I would get bored. But when somebody gives me the honor of exposing a block, one of these blocks that I'll share, it one, it's an honor. And two, it's that it's like, then we get to go into it and the transformation that they have is that much bigger and that much more, let's say, permanent or, or long lasting. Uh, some of the blocks, the first things that, thing that comes to mind is I've found that uh, I sometimes, depending on the client, if they understand this, refer to the chakra system, the energy centers of the body um, from the Sanskrit and Indian tradition. Uh, there's seven of them in the body and the throat area, the throat chakra, uh, can easily kind of close off when we're nervous or anxious or we're really scared to say something or, or just we're putting ourselves out there in our best form and it's, it, it's that vulnerable feeling, that naked feeling. Sometimes the throat muscles, not the vocal cords themselves, but the throat muscles will tighten around the vocal cords and then people will have actual physical pain or vocal resistance. This happens to all of us sometimes, like you get a lump in your throat. Now, if you push through it, sometimes the throat muscles tightening around the vocal cords will push the vocal cords together and they'll rub together. And that can over time and prolonged rubbing can cause polyps and nodules or just some laryngitis, some inflammation in the, in the vocal cords. That's an actual physical block that comes from a mental or emotional space. Another thing, and the reason I mentioned the chakra system is because sometimes, and I find this in men and women, but often in men more, if the throat chakra is really tight, the second chakra, which is the interpersonal chakra, the creative chakra, and the, the uh, sexual and sensual energy space also can be closed off. And that's very common. And it makes sense because they're both creative expressive centers. It's not always the case, but I've noticed it to be common. And so sometimes it goes into that somatic thing. Okay, let's soften, place your, you know, and this, this can take a number of sessions because if there's trauma there, we don't want to go right in really fast, but we do want to start to ask the body, ask the soul and the self, like, have I been hurt here? Or is there, there information I need to know? How can we slowly, gently alleviate this block? So those are two that come to mind. No, it was, it was, I was like, I was like releasing my throat chakra. And then I was, I was, and then I released my second chakra and go, oh, yeah, those are linked. And then I was, I was in my like lower dot, like all the way down there. And then I went, so, and then I was supposed to ask a question. I was like, oh, this is funny. <laughs> you were doing some of the, just tuning in. I love it. <laughs> and silence is okay. Silence is just as important as speaking. Like the silence that you take before you speak, people think they have to speak right away. No, ground yourself, harness your energy, be in your own presence and then speak. It's going to be much more effective. If you need to take a deep breath, even if it's in the middle of an awkward phrase, your audience is going to breathe with you. This is kind of giving you just some random things based on the inspiration, but people are so worried about how they're perceived. 
I'm no different. <laughs> this is practiced. But your audience, most most humans are very empathic. We all feel each other. And so if you're like really tight and nervous and anxious, like we all are sometimes, especially at the beginning of a podcast or whatever, take that time to ground yourself. Let it be awkward. It's usually not because the people listening will pick up on your emotion and your own body, even not if it's aware picking up on it, it's subconscious. And as you ground and breathe, they'll relax more too. Yeah, that's such great advice. I know a lot of people struggle with like the filler words, probably because they can't handle the silence. And I'm probably no different than that on that side. How do you help people when they're, you know, to take the time and to make sure that they don't say all those filler words like ums and ahs and things like that, especially for speaking? Because I'm sure it's I'm guessing that that would be a very common problem that people come to you for. Not actually the most common, but it's always in, it's always, it's usually a part of it. Recently, I heard myself speak and I noticed I was saying um a lot and I thought I got to up my game there. <laughs> um, no, uh, <laughs> again, it's that getting present with ourselves and being okay in the silence. And it takes time and practice. And the other thing is when we do it to not get mad at ourselves. So first it's the catching ourselves and the letting it be there and the retraining our brain to not say, um, and then, you know, silently punch ourselves <laughs> to just let it, the, um, be there proceed. Yeah. That's really, that's really great advice. I mean, it sounds like almost that you're teaching voice as a spiritual practice because this is kind of like mindfulness and self-awareness. I've been placed behind the camera and I definitely notice that if you get somebody just teaching what they love about and they kind of forget themselves on camera, especially then I just say, I call it being in channel. And I've kind of learned that when that turns on, because we've worked with a lot of spiritual teachers therapists and such when that turns on, I never cut it off. I always just let them keep going. And then it's almost like a, it's almost like a light switch, you know, instantly when it, when the channel clicks off, it's like the, it's like the, the field cha changes and then they, they start thinking again, or they, they're distracted. Um, so I'm always trying to make people feel comfortable. I'm curious if you see something similar and how you get people into that I guess they would call it like a flow state where you're just having something come through you versus um, thinking about the next thing you're going to say. Yes. I love the flow state. Okay. So one of the questions I usually feel, it's not even that I think I'm going to ask it or that I plan to ask it. I feel compelled to ask it as I'm getting to know somebody and I'll ask it over and over again until I feel that they're telling the ultimate truth, their ultimate truth, which is what do you want? What do you desire? What, what would bring you pleasure or joy or what do you want? And sometimes I'll ask a more specific question. So in the next like five years, what do you see your career being? Or what do you, if, okay, this, this was a good way to ask it. If there were no judgments or limitations of what was possible, what do you see yourself doing? And I have to reiterate, if there were no judgments, self-judgments or limitations of what is possible, because we all are like, well, within these boundaries of what I think is possible, that helps me help people get into the flow state, because then we can go directly toward that. And like you were saying, it's like their eyes light up, our eyes light up when we are talking about something that is so true for us. I'm also, you know, a lot of times you'll see it, like you see great speakers and they have to repeat their story over and over again. <laughs> and if you have to like listen to the same story, it's a little bit um, tedious, but at the same time, they're telling the story that impacts, has impacted their life and impacted others. Um, do you work with people to tell their origin stories and how to, how to present that in a manner? And I'm also kind of curious just on voice inflection and how that comes in and some of the common things that you help people with in terms of, uh, cause I, my sense is some people are really flat, you know, and they don't have much of a range and that, that come, it, it comes across as boring, but they're not really boring. They're just flat, you know? 
There's two questions there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Origin story. A lot of people don't say I need to work on my origin story. They're just coming for the general, like I need to present myself better. I need to, I need to have more authority. I need to command this room better. I need to bring the joy back into what, you know, I, you actually made me think of singers who go onto stages, especially let's say Lady Gaga or David Bowie, or these famous tour, touring artists who Beyonce, who sing the same songs 30 million times, maybe 30,000 times, literally. If they sang it the same way every time, they, they would go crazy themselves. Maybe the first 12 performances, they sing it the same way. But then I'm sure you've heard, even if you don't have the most musical ear, they start to embellish it. They start to add extra little runs or syncopate the rhythm so that they come in just a little bit differently. But if you don't have a musical ear, you might not know, but you feel their own vibe and energy stays fresh if they're masterful at it. It's the same for telling your origin story. It's the same for, it's like, you might add, add in this little anecdote that somebody, that a family member shared, or you might start to get goofy while you talk about it. As long as it's you, your authentic you, it doesn't matter. And good interviewers will start to ask a little bit of a different story as well. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it's how are you, how are you showing up and approaching it? And with what I, I, this is something I'll use, like what, how do you want to feel when you share it? And how do you want your audience to feel when you share it? And even just having a word or an intention there helps your experience of it be different. So I really, those are, some I really love, yeah, I really love that. How, to, how, how do you want to feel and how do you want somebody else to feel? Cause that's kind of how we think about a lot of things in marketing is what's the feeling we're trying to transmit either through the video or the sales page or the, the ad or whatever. And if we know, if we can help people to feel something, then, um, then, then we can invite them in to, to buy or to at least see if it's right for them. Right. And this is, this is marketing with our voices. Yeah. So, I love that. Can you say more about that marketing with your voices? I love that. Yeah. It's like, it's like everything we do is marketing. It's, it's what uh, Caroline Miss says, every word we say is a prayer. And in a similar vein, every word we say to the world is marketing, is, 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 is even branding, is an expression of who we are. So when I started, my best marketing wasn't, wasn't Facebook ads or flyers I was putting up in coffee shops or any of that. My best marketing was when I got freaking vulnerable on Facebook and I would share something that had nothing to do with my coaching. And then I would get people that would write to me and they were like, you helped me through a divorce or you, and I'm not, I wasn't divorced or you helped me, uh, you inspire me so much. I want to work with you <laughs> just for being strangely vulnerable in a space that a lot of people were not. And I know a lot of your work, Kylie, and I know that you you do that in such a masterful way. So yeah, it's like, it's not about perfection because people don't trust people who are so perfect that they don't show their humanity. It's about, again, finding our own safe space within ourselves to be as real as possible. And then as we continue to hone our message, who we are and what we're offering, that comes together with our authentic, vulnerable expression really beautifully. Ooh, I love that. So if people are just kind of starting to notice their voice and wanting to do this type of work, what are some of the first things that you ask them to pay attention to? Well, the first thing is, is this person really separated from their body when they're trying to vocally express themselves? That would be one of the first things I ask them to pay attention to because some people are not, I don't have to focus as much on the somatic body, but some people are, I was, I was really disconnected and I had to learn to get back into my body, which is a constant practice to get even deeper and really grounded in our bodies. So that would be the first, um, sometimes it is 
I'll have us do some exercises, like some call and response exercises where I make a sound and they repeat after me. And sometimes I'll be playing my drum while we do that so that there's some rhythm involved, which helps people feel grounded. And not only do people think, wow, that was fun, but while they are, do even if they were nervous when they started, it's still fun. While they're doing it, I hear, oh, okay, their voice gets shaky around these pitches or, oh, I can tell that they're having fun, but they're holding their chest muscles. Like, so depending on what I hear, like that, those exercises help me kind of diagnose what's happening. And then I might have them start to do some really goofy exercises and any voice or acting class, you're going to have to get goofy. (laughs) You're just, it's to play with their voice. Like we did when we were babies so that they can just get to know their voice. So for instance, a very common vocal exercise is called the siren. You're almost imitating a fire truck and you're going, ooh, you're you're playing with your voice in ways that you probably haven't done unless you're imitating a little child or have taken some voice lessons. That will help people start to become so vocal aware. Those are really useful tips. Uh, well, it's it's kind of like, I feel like we should have you keep coming back and maybe even teach in some of our courses because I think all of us, we need more we need more conscious people showing up online, uh, sharing their authentic voice in an embodied way. I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing if more of us can be embodied. Um, if people do want to reach out to you, uh, how can they find out more about you, Ariella, and where can they go? You can go to my coaching website, which is ariellaapproach.com. Okay. And can you tell us some of the options you have? Do you have like a, like a coaching packages? Do you run groups or have a program or? Uh, I do. I have right now. I currently, I do have another coach who works through my company also. She's wonderful. And she sees people weekly uh, Mm -hmm. for as long as they want. I see people in packages or a four or six week package to start or a two hour immersion with a 30 minute (laughs) follow-up because (laughs) I find that sometimes people want the repeated sessions to keep coming back and practicing in between and honing their skill. But sometimes they just want a deep dive into everything voice. And then if people want to work with me after a package or the immersion, we can do one-off sessions here and there. And that happens sometimes. And sometimes people get I find that people can get everything they need as long as they practice and integrate what we've worked on in just four weeks. Okay. That's awesome. Uh, Well, thank you for being on the show today and sharing your wisdom with everybody. And thanks to all the listeners who have tuned into the Conscious Marketer podcast. If you want to find the show notes and get the links to the show, um, you can go to consciousmarketer.com forward slash podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today, Ariella. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to talk to you both. And thanks, Kylie, for being here, co-interviewing. And thanks to the listeners. And we'll see you on the next show. Bye for now.